Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Russell Frederick as tonight's guest speaker. Born in Brooklyn and of Panamanian descent, Russell is best known for his long-term documentation of the life in his neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant. His many editorial clients include the New York Times, the Daily Beast, the Wall Street Journal, NBC News, the Associated Press, the World Photography Organization magazine, Photo District News, Spiegel magazine, Slate, New York magazine, Ebony, and the Amsterdam News. Among many other venues, his photographs have been exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Rush Arts Gallery, the International Center of Photography, Addis Photo Festival in Ethiopia, the Goethe Institute, Ghana, Visa Purlimash, and the Shanghai International Photo Festival. Russell is also a proud member of Komoinge Inc. I see a few familiar faces here tonight. Welcome Komoinge. Um, it's an African-American photography collective known for its 50 plus years documentation of African diaspora. Beyond photography, Russell dedicates his time to mentoring at-risk young men with the Kings Against Violence Initiative, where he is the men's program director. So please help me welcome Russell Frederick to our lecture series. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to see you all, especially on this chilly night. I'm sure everybody would like to be home with the remote control in their hand. Um, having some coffee or soup. Glad you are here. Um, so I'm going to take you all just on a little walk with me um, through the place that was my home for 18 years. Um, I uh, was born in Bushwick and my childhood and my adult years were actually spent in Bed-Stuy. I got my first apartment in Bedford-Stuyvesant at the age of 19 and I lived there until the age of 37. Um, at the age of 19, uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, for those of you who don't know, may be unfamiliar, it is the other black mecca um, on the opposite side of the bridge, you know, to Harlem. So everyone uh, pretty much around the nation knows as Harlem to be the black mecca, but Bedford-Stuyvesant also too has been rich and, you know, with black culture. Um, the list goes on and on. People, Lena Horns from Bedford-Stuyvesant, Earl Graves from Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, Jackie Gleason even lived in Bedford-Stuyvesant. That's right, believe that, Jackie Gleason. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of you know Jay-Z, uh, rapper Big Daddy Kane, Lenny Kravitz. I can go on and on and on and on. Chris Rock, everybody knows. Um, but for me, and just to give you a little bit more background, Bedford-Stuyvesant uh, is always a place that never got, I think, a fair shake uh, to the pioneers and the good people who made the community. Often just portrayed for its challenges and never really seen, I would say, for its virtues. So um, with some of the pictures you're about to see, um, you're going to see just my honor to the people who made this community. I started documenting the community in 1999. Uh, 1997 was actually when I made my commitment to photography. So before this, I was a architecture student. Um, always was had artistic nature in me from childhood, but my family being from Panama and doing artwork, they were like, "Art is a hobby. That is not a job, not a career." So when uh, going through the channels of life architecture school, found that way too tedious for my brain, um, left that alone, then actually got introduced to nursing. My mom was a nurse and really enjoyed that, but I found that environment way too stringent for my, for, for me, <laughs> and picked up a camera, actually in 1995, had no idea what I was doing, didn't know the difference between an f-stop and a bus stop. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> figured it out in 1997, uh, took an intro course at the International Center of Photography, saved up my money. I read an article in Time Out magazine about intro to black and white film. 
And I said, okay, I'm gonna just see what this is about. On the first day of class, instructor by the name of Bernard Pillay, he told me I would be a great photographer. I never looked back, couldn't afford to go to school. So I just went to Barnes and Nobles, like almost every day, looked through magazines, books, studying photos, taking pictures voraciously. And in 1999, I saw the writing on the wall about what's happening in Bed-Stuy right now. Everybody thought I was crazy at the time when I said that this community was gonna change. Everyone, people, people in the community were like, Russell, this is the biggest black community in America. Where are all these people gonna go? I said, watch. So I'm gonna introduce you to some of the people. Enough talking, let's get to photos. I have quite a few to show you, but I, I can tell you pretty much the story on each photo, but I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on some of the pictures. Uh, photo over here was taken in 2006 or 2007. This is Supernova Slum. He is a rapper, community activist, author, also to a uh, retired National Guardsman, and he's also a dream director at the Future Project. Um, he is also two part Cherokee Indian. He uh, has that the feathers in his hair are acknowledging or representing his Cherokee heritage. The beads were actually red and blue to signify unity between the Bloods and Crips gang. The Egyptian um, tattoos you see are pretty much his homage, you know, to the ancestors. Moving on. So on this day, it was like 90 something degrees. Supernova was feeling himself. He just came out the gym. And um, for the most part, um, I pretty much had saw the advertisement on the back by the subway. This actually, for those who um, probably weren't in the community at the time, or in New York at the time, this was an ad for TV One. So TV One, um, all black um, television network, I believe with Time Warner or Cablevision, uh, they started that this year, and this was their ad, I See Black People. So uh, sometimes I just like to play off of words uh, because they can have, add a little bit more body to a photograph and just waited for the right moment, and there you go. This is uh, Maat Petrova. She's actually from Trinidad and Tobago. She is a mother of three. She is also um, a fitness instructor, and she's also a life coach. She uh, got her master's degree actually in 2013. Um, lived in Bed-Stuy uh, for over 15 years and no longer lives in the community. Now she's in um, Atlanta couldn't afford, you know what, to stay in the community anymore. Easter Sunday, Bed-Stuy. Uh, this is taken at the AME uh, Methodist Church. This is over by Tompkins and Decatur, I believe. Um, so right after Easter Sunday Church, ladies actually from South Carolina, I just approached them, asked them if I could take their picture. They were waiting for access to ride, and there goes the photo. This is three generations. Um, this is a Santeria church, actually on Fulton Street, close to Bedford Avenue. So this is actually um, grandmom, daughter, and granddaughter right before service. Did this image in 2007. And I believe the church is still, still there. This is um, Reginald Lewis, and on the left, with the, you know what, furry white beard, and his good friend of, I think, 30 years, uh, can't remember his name right now, but this was actually taken in 2014 at the 25th anniversary of the Spike Lee block party. Reginald Davis and, and the other brother have lived in the community for over 40 years. This is Sean Flowers, literally, that's her name. She is from Belize. Um, Sean is actually an educator. Um, uh, she was actually waiting for a taxi and took this image in 2011. She no longer lives in the community. She now lives in Maryland. This is Alzo Slade, originally from Houston, Texas. He is a photographer. Also, too, he is a comedian. Did this image in 2010 on Howard Avenue. This is part of a series that I'm in, in an exhibit called the Dandelion Series. Cleveland Sampson, 
Cleveland is actually from Guyana. He is a carpenter and an actor. Took this image in 2010 as well, Chauncey Street on the J train. So with my photos, again, everybody is in trying to, well, I also started this project was when I told people um, where I lived. A lot of people said to me, oh, you live in bed -Stuy. you must walk around with a bulletproof vest and a helmet. And when people told me this, um, and this was like in the early 2000s, 90s, um, I was pretty offended because I knew just what was always shown in the papers was just one perspective. So to counter that, again, I just felt like the truth would be told just through the photographs. This is Salome um, Hiralima. She's actually from Oakland, uh, California. She is a dream director and did this image in 2009, I believe. She's still here in Brooklyn. This is Nasanimo Diodi. He is actually from Dominica. He is an artist. He is a jewelry maker, fashion designer, also carpenter. Um, I know he and him and his wife moved out of the community, but I believe they're back in Brooklyn now. Nasanimo and his wife knew me. Um, expecting their first child, did this image actually last year, 2015, and they gave birth to a healthy baby boy. <laughs> yes. This is Joshua B. Alafia and his wife, um, Yaya. A lot of you may be familiar with her. She was an actress. Um, she's an actress that was in the, what was the movie, F, The Butler. The Butler, she starred in The Butler, and she was also on America's Top Model. And Joshua Bialafia is a filmmaker from the community. Yaya and Joshua expecting their first. Did this image actually in 2014. This is Ivory. Did this image in 2006, 2007. Ivory holding her goddaughter. It was a little hot and she actually just got fed from the mother, and Ivy was just being a good godmother. <laughs> this is Gilo. Gilo's from the community. He's lived in bedside all of his life. He's a proud father of three. Saw him walking down Jefferson Avenue. This is in 2007. He was with his three kids, just picked up some of his children from daycare, and his daughter started having a tantrum. Here he goes. <laughs> Can't remember this young man's name, but uh, did this image. This is on Macon Street. Took this in 2009, but he was with his father, and he. I remember him saying to his father, Daddy, I'm a king. <laughs> <laughs> this is Supreme and Tyshawn. Did this image in 2005. Uh, Supreme is actually Tyshawn's actually stepfather. So they were going to be stepping out somewhere, I can't recall at the moment, but um, I was talking to Supreme about just the project that I was doing and really trying to honor the good people and show the world really who we were. And he said to me uh, that I could photograph him and he mentioned about they were gonna be stepping out. So he was teaching Tayshawn how to tie a tie for the first time. And during this moment, Supreme told me he loves being a stepdad because a stepdad is a man who steps up to be a dad. This is Michael Young. Michael Young was on his way to Sunday school with his father and his sister. Uh, chased him down um, from the back. I, I saw him walking. I, I saw that hat and that suit was way too big for him from behind. So I uh, asked him um, to, if I could take his photograph. He said, sure. His father I took a family po po portrait. But in taking this picture, uh, I asked Michael, was this his first suit? And he said, yes. And he said his mom told him that he's going to have to grow into this suit. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, oh gosh, I believe her name is Natasha. It was her sweet 16. It was at my studio. She was actually waiting for a date. Her date was late, and she was a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> this is Angel and his girlfriend. So Angel and his girlfriend were having a playful argument about texting and answering the phone. Um, his lady was saying, when I call you, you don't answer, but when I text you, you text me back. 
what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> this was in actually 2011. <laughs> and they broke up shortly after this picture. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, can't remember this young lady's name. Um, actually uh, was walking by, uh, saw her on the steps. Um, she was telling me about how she was going to have to move, and it was just a really stressful time. And um, this is the image. Did this on Halsey Street. This was around 2007. This is Nunu. Um, I actually saw her walking down the street with this t-shirt, asked her if I could take a picture of her. Um, she said, sure. Um, a lot of times when I photograph people, the vast majority of the time, I really try to give them a copy of the picture. So I will email them or I'll ask them for their address, tell them I can send them a print, tell them it's free. Mm -hmm. I always speak to their people. I pretty much want to learn the story of everybody. And in honoring, you know, with everyone, uh, I try to pretty much have a conversation with everybody. And just, you know what, um, hear this story about Bedford-Stuyvesant. So with this image over here, um, Nunu, um, when I sent her the photograph, uh, she was extremely embarrassed. The young lady is actually her niece, and she thanked me for sending her the picture, and she told me she threw out that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> These are some bloods. So I um, was walking down the street. This is on Franklin Avenue, 2006, 2007. So saw the young men, um, but had my camera, and um, a few of them just asked me if they could, one of them, no, two guys just asked if, they, if I could take their picture, and I said, sure, and when I said I'd show it to them, all of these guys just jumped in line and just, you know what, posed. So um, this photograph, pretty important, because a lot of you may hear of the Bloods and their reputation. So with that, I think in just walking the streets with love, um, you pretty much, when you walk with love, you walk with respect, people will treat you with that. If you walk the streets with fear, then actually you will, you know what will happen. Now, in photographing these young men, I asked about four of them, um, what is it that made you join the game? Um, all of them said safety and brotherhood. And in speaking to all of them, most of them pretty much had single parent homes. Some of them weren't even staying with their mothers. They were staying with some of the gentlemen, you know, in the gang, and they pretty much were just as their family. This is Kaz. Kaz uh, actually is a rapper. Kaz, uh, this was at the Chinese restaurant um, on Troop by Halsey Street. So I was waiting for some Chinese food. Kaz approached me at, uh, with his CD. And he pulled out his CD and asked me if I could buy it. And when I looked at the CD, it had some scribble on it. And I said, bro, would you buy this CD if you saw this in a store? And he said, you're right, bro, I, I wouldn't. And I said, so this is what we're going to do. I'll photograph you. You give me the blessing to make, put the image in my book, and then you got an album cover. Deal. There it was. <laughs> The police, this young man was just riding his bike. He actually jumped up on the sidewalk to go to Popeye's. At least I heard, heard him say he wanted to get some chicken. Cops stopped him, arrested. This is uh, Councilman Charles Barron. There was an incident. This was at the Bravo super, uh, supermarket. A mentally ill man, well known in the community, can't remember his name right now. He had a breakdown in the supermarket, cops were called. Um, this picture speaks for itself. I think you know what happened. Charles Barron was trying to reason. Not much success. This is Slim. Slim actually was shot in the head. His people tried to break into his apartment. Um, he got shot in the head twice. Um, this is his father by his bedside. His father lived in London. Slim actually lived, um, moved out of Virginia, and is actually, you know what, having, you know what, a pretty decent life. And he is a born-again Christian now. This friend of mine is Al. Um, this was taken in 2001, Rikers Island. Uh, so Al is a good friend of mine. He was locked up for, you know what, unjustly, so in jail. Uh, for two weeks, him and his girlfriend had gotten into an argument. Um, she called the police, and after further investigation, uh, the cops dropped the charges. But in being locked up, 
two and a half weeks, he ended up losing both of his jobs and actually uh, fell behind on his house, lost his house, and his life hasn't been the same since. He is uh, currently trying to get like a kidney transplant. His life hasn't been the same since 2001. And, um, and again, he was unjustly locked up. Timothy Stansberry, killed by the police. Um, no weapon, no criminal record uh, in the Louis Armstrong houses over by Nostrand Avenue, close to Lexington. He was coming home from a party um, in the projects, and a, pol a police officer was on patrol in the stairway, walking up the steps. Uh, Timothy Stansberry entered the building from the rooftop. The projects are four stories tall, and they're all, you know, were joined together. So a lot of people in the development, they commute to different buildings through the rooftop. And when he entered, a um, police officer was startled, shot him one time in the chest. He died. Uh, there was no trial. Cop didn't even go to jail. Um, that story continues. Uh, this is, I uh, can't remember this gentleman's name, but these are, this was a tribute, you know, to the gentleman, um, Timothy Stansberry. Um, his street name was Drag, and this was a little tribute that the gentleman gave to him. This is Dr. Robert Gore. He's an emergency room physician at Kings County Medical Center. He's also the executive director of the Kings Against Violence Initiative, which I'm a part of. I'm the men's program director. The Kings Against Violence Initiative is an intervention program geared to help at-risk young men and women in high school who are at risk for dropping out, at risk for violence. Um, Dr. Gore um, has pretty much started the program because a lot of young men and women that he was seeing in his emergency room who are actually victims of a violent crime, uh, they are at risk for another violent crime. There's a 50% actually risk for another violent crime to occur if someone comes in shot or stabbed. So we try to work with a lot of young men, women who are actually, you know, at, at risk, um, who may have some challenges at home, in school, some behavioral, you know, with issues. We try to just meet them where they are um, as just life coaches. And we started the program in 2011 with about six students, and now we have like almost 60 a week. Janella Johnny, uh, Janella Johnny, this was taken actually at a former Black Panther office. Um, did this in 2009. Janelle is actually, I believe, I'm not sure if she still is an NYU adjunct professor, but I know she was. And she, yes, no problem, no problem. Um, but this storefront is obviously gone. A uh, woman actually is from Gambia, can't remember her name right now, but this was at the Tribute to the Ancestors ceremony. Um, can't remember her name right now, but she lived in Bedford Stuyvesant. So just took this image, the tribute to the ancestors for those who are unfamiliar. It is a uh, homage to all of those who died in the Middle Passage coming to America from Africa. And in Coney Island, the second um, Saturday in July, it, there is this ceremony which takes place um, in, in Coney Island, right down by the water. Drumming, very spiritual, has been going on for, I believe, more than 30 years. Ramadan. So uh, this is Bedford and Fulton. So uh, this is at Mashid uh, at Taqwa. Um, so I also too, in documenting the community, I also just wanted to show the world a different image of Islam. Plenty of Muslims live in the community. I'm not a Muslim, but I've never liked the portrayal or of a lot of the Muslim community. And really just to show the world how we all live together and um, the, the men are outside praying at Ramadan for the Eid uh, because the mosque gets so full that they actually start praying in the streets. Um, some other um, Muslim women in the community, I believe these women are from Pakistan. Um, so there was some activity down the block with the police and I knew I didn't have much time to actually take the photograph. Um, I knew that I couldn't really interact with the women just being um, in learning about Islam, that a lot of Muslim women aren't supposed to speak to a man who's not a Muslim. So I knew I had you know, just a few seconds um, to take the photograph. I knew it was an important image to take. And uh, there you have it showing the difference in generations. All right, this is um, Don Baladine. He's from Trinidad and Tobago. He's a fashion designer. He is everything that he's wearing, he made. His clothing line is called Swag Star Nation. He did not make the Yankee fitted. Um, <laughs> this is uh, actually on Franklin Avenue, 
by DeKalb. So it's a tribute. The, the spray painted mural is a tribute to our hometown hero, Notorious B.I.G. And for all of you who don't know, you need to get some of that music. <laughs> this is Akila Walker. Akila is from Jamaica. Um, I'm Jamaica the country, not Jamaica Queens. Um, all due respect. <laughs> um, and uh, she is a theology student. Did this image on Halsey by Nostrand. This is Ava Griffiths. Ava Griffiths is a social worker, also too from Jamaica. Um, has her tribute to Nefertiti in her ears. And she too no longer lives in Brooklyn, moved out of New York, um, I believe in 2010. Russell, can, yes. I, can I ask you? Uh, sure. You uh, have this amazing knowledge of the community and how every so often you say, this person does not live in the community anymore. How, how do you stay in touch or how do you keep track of everybody's? Whereabouts? Um, I always try to, one, I give everyone my card, always walk with the business card. Also, two, during these early years before cell phones, uh, really for me, um, I always walked around with like a reporter's notebook. So I would keep notes, um, would try to email people. My phone number has stayed the same. So with that, um, a lot of people have reached out to me, see me in passing. And with that, I always try to develop relationships. So in sending people copies of the photographs, I would keep in contact. But in always in meeting anyone, I always just make it my business to learn who they are. So I really don't like to, um, I call it take out, just take good pictures and run. I pretty much like to have, you know what, some interactions because I want to, you know what, tell the story of people. Um, I think it's, at least for me and the work that I do, I just think it's only the right thing to do. We got enough time? Yes. Okay. This is um, Ian. Ian is actually an IT guy. So he was having a cigar break, did this image in 2014. He just finished shoveling some snow. This was on Troop. This is Alonzo Dale. He is from um, Panama. Um, Alonzo is one of the most best dressed guys in Bed-Stuy. <laughs> um, did this in 2010. He's also part of the Dandelion series. He's an event planner. Um, and he's also, he was a co-founder of this clothing line called the Brooklyn Circus. There's some clean brothers over here. Um, so about three of these brothers live in Bed-Stuy. Um, and a few of them also from Harlem. This is also too part of the Dandelion series which is just to show the world, I think, a whole nother image of black men and black men who are, you know, we're bringing back style or who will pretty much are carrying the same dignity and sophistication that uh, a lot of us did back in the 40s and the 50s before hip hop. This is Panama. He's actually from Panama, from Colon, Panama. He is a barber, um, lived in Bedford Stuyvesant for 30 years, no longer lives in the community. This is Kingsley, he's from Ghana. Um, Kingsley is, grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, he actually lives still in Brooklyn, um, married. He's also a designer. He has a clothing line called Prevailage, and he's part of the Dandelion series. Did this image in 2010 on Chauncey Street. This is Duke, um, did this on Fulton Street, 2003. Saw Duke actually walking down the street talking on the phone and that cigarette did not fall. So <laughs> I had to stop him. I said, I mean, brother, you gotta let me take a photo. And he said, you have two seconds. I gotta go. Uh, he said, you're not paying? He said, are you paying? He said, if you're paying, you can take more pictures. So this was it. <laughs> this is Uwa Ageto. Uwa is from the Edo tribe, um, Nigeria. She is a fashion professor. She's a professor at FIT. And she's also used to be a model. She's wearing an Ankara skirt, which is actually from her tribe in Nigeria. This is uh, Abdu, Abdu Sar. Abdu is from Senegal. Um, Abdu actually drives a ta taxi, and he actually was just, you know, a real fresh one day. Saw him walking down the street and he stopped for a photograph on Halsey Street. This was in 2010. This is Sean Robinson. Sean is a communications engineer. He was coming out of the Victorian bed and breakfast. Um, saw him coming out. He was too clean and I just stopped him, asked if I could take a picture. He told me I had five minutes. He was gonna send an email 
and then he had to go. Um, the Victorian Bed and Breakfast actually has been on the market for $6 million. It's a black woman who owned it. She bought the house actually in the 80s for 300000 This is Pops. Pops is a retired bus driver. Uh, did this, this is on Fulton Street. Took this around 2007, 2008. Um, Pops is well known uh, for greeting everybody. He sweeps, keeps the neighborhood clean. And this was Pops' phone. If anybody wanted to use that pay phone, you had to see Pops. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mr. Thomas. He's from Virginia. He worked for the Department of Welfare for 25 years, retired. He's also a record producer. He's standing with his pride and joy, his 1974 Cadillac. Did this image last year. And Mr. Thomas, I think, is the only man in Brooklyn still with a jerry curl. Okay? <laughs> Can't remember this brother's name right here, but um, he pulled up to a light. This is actually on Fulton by Brevoort. Saw him in the car. I came up to the window, asked him if I could take a photo. He said, brother, you have one minute. When that light turns green, I got to go. There goes the picture. <laughs> This is uh, Mr. Rodriguez, and Mr. Rodriguez is on the right, and I'm having a brain cramp right now with the other brother in the back, but Mr. Rodriguez is actually a retired factory worker from Puerto Rico. The other brother's name, he is a retired porter actually from Cuba. Um, I can't remember his name, did this image in actually 20, 2013, I believe. This is by Gates Avenue. So they had just met up at the bodega for the first time. They hadn't seen each other in the winter time and they were just coming out for a warm day. Can't remember this brother's name. Um, saw him walking down the street. Um, I do remember that he was from Grenada. Um, stopped him. Um, again, did this image in 2007. Very timely. The back of the t-shirt. So, and I do remember he's a caseworker for this organization, also his occupation. This is uh, T. T actually was a boxer, um, went, was struggling with addiction issues, and actually got, did some time on Rikers Island, got into a fight on Rikers Island, and someone hit him in the eye with a padlock. And he was, uh, his retina became detached, he's been blind in his right eye, and you know what, he's just trying to just make it day by day. Jazz musicians, this was on Nostrand Avenue in Hancock. So um, the, the saxophone player actually lived in the building for 30 plus years, um, was from the community, and played jazz uh, pretty much to greet people in the summertime as they were walking down the streets around maybe 8 a.m. to around noon. And as the community started to become more gentrified, landlord was actually, you know what, threatening him about how we had to go. And then there were actually complaints about noise pollution from some of the news neighbors. And um, they were told they had to get a permit um, to actually play jazz. So it stopped playing jazz. And eventually, you know what, gentlemen found out that he was uh, pushed out. This is Mo. Mo uh, is from Bed-Stuy. Uh, went to the Air Force four years. This was him returning from Afghanistan. Um, this is his house where he grew up at. And now Mo works for Con Edison as a splicer, doing well. Uh, did this image in 2003. Uh, this was on Fulton Street, close to Marcy by Restoration. So saw this woman coming down the, the, the street. I couldn't believe my eyes. I knew I didn't have much time to talk to her. Took the photo and actually her husband confronted me of asking me about what am I doing <laughs> and, and I said, good intentions, and uh, just doing a book on the neighborhood, and told him I could give him a copy of the picture, and he said he didn't want one, and I said, well, I would like to give you one, offered him my card, he said, keep it, and he said, as long as it's positive, it's okay, and he said, but, he said, as long as it's positive, it's okay, but next time, don't photograph my wife unless you ask. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, um, I believe his name is Mr. Johnson. So Mr. Johnson worked for NBC for 20 plus years, got laid off, worked in the cafeteria, couldn't find another job. 
um, and without with him not being able to make find another job, just trying to make ends meet, worked six days a week, 14 hours a day, just actually getting bottles and then taking them to the supermarket to just get some money. Window shopper, Nostrand Avenue, um, close between Fulton Street and Herkimer. Did this image in 2011. It's actually my grandfather. Did this image in 2007. Getting ready for church. The call to prayer. So uh, did this image around 2004. Uh, the, so for those of you who know, I mean Muslims you know, would pray five times a day. And in the community, there is uh, pretty much like uh, a call to prayer, which comes off through, um, what would you call that? Uh, not, it's not an alarm, but pretty much there's an announcement on a loudspeaker throughout the community. Um, and people, you know what, all the Muslims, you know, who are in the community, they hear it, and they pretty much are given a pass from their employers to come, you know, to the mosque and pray. This is a halal Chinese restaurant. Um, so the sign says, no pork. Um, so saw the ladies waiting for their order and just had to take it because I knew a lot of people would not believe a Chinese restaurant not selling pork. <laughs> This is Vicky and Tony, actually together 20 plus years. Uh, they were, this was their anniversary, wanted to take their pic, they wanted the picture taken, came to my studio. Um, sadly enough, uh, Vicky passed away uh, three years ago and Tony has not been the same. This is uh, Mama, um, that's her nickname, she's not my mama. <laughs> um, she, uh, this is on Brevoort Place. So um, she, Mama, is well known for her, for her laughter, um, for being a strong woman, and we all know that's not Pepsi in that bag. <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember this brother's name. Um, he just came out of his apartment building. Uh, this is on Nostrand Avenue. He was on his way to a baby christening and just told me um, that as long as I was going to take a good picture, I could take his picture. This is Ronnie. Ronnie is a retired Marine. She's also an accountant. Um, she also does jewelry and a hairstylist. She did this image in 2009 at my studio. She no longer lives in Brooklyn. Ronnie now lives in Florida. This is Big Franco. This is on Fulton Street. Um, Big Franco had just picked up his chain. He was real happy. <laughs> this is Stacy Muhammad. Stacey Muhammad is a filmmaker and a writer, um, originally from New Orleans. Uh, she moved to Bedford-Stuyvesant because she was inspired very much by Spike Lee and did this image in 2014. I believe Stacey uh, moved out of bed -Stuy as well. She now lives in Atlanta. And that's her dog, Ziggy. <laughs> this is uh, Rachel. Rachel is from Haiti. She is a dancer, mother of two. Um, I just finished photographing Rachel, and she was just looking at some of the photos, and this was actually the best picture as she was looking at the pictures in her bedroom. This was in 2009. Rachel, too, no longer lives in the community. She lives in Florida. Can't remember this brother's name. Um, this was in Stuyvesant Park. He was playing some music on this instrument. It's not a Cora. Um, I forgot the name of the exact instrument, but it's pretty much like a handheld piano. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and um, did this image in 2007. Uh, this is again Ava Griffiths. Uh, took this picture of her. She was actually, you see, getting some coconut from um, the Dominican guy who actually sells a lot of fresh fruit um, from his hometown. Uh, this is on Fulton Street by Bedford. Did this in 2007. This is Neat Rasit. Neet Rasit is from the is from the island nation of Haiti. She is a third generation seamstress. Um, did this, she, this was at her studio on Nostrand Avenue, 2009. She no longer has the studio. No longer lives in Bed Stuy. She is uptown in Harlem right now. This is Kepra. Kepra is originally from Dallas, Texas. Um, she's at her place, actually on the deck. Um, Kepra is a mother of three and she had wanted me to take a nude of her. 
um, and this was a photograph. Did this in 2011. This is Caxme. Caxme is from Haiti. Caxme, at the age of 15, was diagnosed with bone cancer. Um, and going through the treatment, she beat it. At 16, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And in going through that treatment, the bone cancer came back. And doctors said that she had to have her leg amputated. And getting her leg amputated, Caxme still graduated from high school on time. And I took this picture in 2011. And six months after this photograph, she graduated from City College, got her degree in international studies. She was actually, she has a prosthetic leg, walks with crutches. Um, and right now, Caxme is a model, making a living. God bless her. This is Ronnie. Right before uh, Ronnie moved out, the woman who you saw in my studio um, in 2009, I did this image in 2011 or 2012. Uh, Ronnie was expecting and reached out to me and asked me if I could take this photograph right before she left Brooklyn and moved to Florida. This is on Green Avenue. Gail Johnson from Jamaica, expecting at my studio, was expecting her first child. Um, Gail also too did this image in 2009. Gail also too lives in Florida. This is Juve. For those of you who don't know, that is the, the pre-festival to the West Indian Day Parade by Eastern Parkway. If you want a good party, go to Juve. <laughs> <laughs> These are some guys who just train and love themselves. This is on Eastern Parkway, <laughs> West Indian Day Parade. Also another good reason to go to Juve, all right? Eye candy, all right? <laughs> this is Emma, Emma's from Ghana. Um, saw Emma on Fulton Street and was trying to get a photograph of her. She was refusing. I had to walk and convince her for three blocks until we finally got to her door. And I said, just one picture, please, just one. And she said, if you leave me alone, you have the picture. <laughs> this was the photograph. She loved the photo, um, gave her a copy. She was extremely happy and then wanted me to photograph her some more. <laughs> This is Ruddy Roy. A lot of you may be familiar with him. Photographer, good friend, also Kamange um, Brethren. And this is his first one son, son Mosiah. Uh, this was in 2007. Actually, on the steps of our apartment, we were neighbors for one year. Ruddy's from Jamaica. This over here is Hakima Hapa. Hakima is from originally from Florida. Um, been in Brooklyn for a good while now. She is a fashion designer. She has a clothing line called Harriet's Alter Ego. Um, did this image in 2006 or 2007. Uh, it's her daughter, Nzinga. I was photographing her, and then Nzinga got hungry, asked her if it was okay, and there goes the picture. This is Thema, who's a hairstylist, and Coco. Thema is from Brooklyn. Coco on the left is actually from Trinidad. Coco is a model. Did this image in 2014 at the Aquaba Mansion. This is King Lion from Jamaica. He's a Rastafarian, a vegan chef, and that's him with his proud daughter, Queen Omenga, at 2014. These are some um, Sikh boys. It's actually from a gentleman who used to own a shop by a gentleman by the name of Paul, who was actually um, from India. Paul had five businesses in the community. But with the changes coming to bed he no longer has his businesses. I believe he has only one business. He pretty much sold a lot of traditional clothing, you know what, from India. Um, but business has changed. He said a lot of his customers pretty much have disappeared, and he's had to downsize. Kids being kids, some Muslim kids in the community right outside the mosque. This is on Bedford Avenue um, and Fulton Street. This was Easter Sunday, um, <laughs> 2004, 2005. Um, I had my camera and he posed. <laughs> Here it is. Grandfather with his grandchildren, around 2005. Uh, I can't remember this woman's name. This was Palm Sunday at, Uni at James United Methodist Church on Malcolm X Boulevard, Monroe Street. Um, trying to remember her name, but I know she was waiting for a taxi, but I know she passed away as well. This is Mr. 
Dabney Montgomery. He was actually Tuskegee Airman. So he actually was in the neighborhood and met Mr. Dabney Montgomery. He's actually from Harlem. Um, but when I met him, he I told me about, you know, what he had some time in Bedford Stuyvesant and he told me about he would like me to photograph him with his Medal of Honor that he got from George W. Bush. And there goes the photo. This is Mr. and Mrs. Pritchett. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pritchett, um, they have been married. This was their 50th wedding anniversary. They met at Morgan State College. Mr. Pritchett was a chemistry instructor, and Mrs. Pritchett was one of his students. Scandal. And <laughs> they uh, moved to Beth Stuyvesant 40 plus years ago. Um, and at, this was their last photograph together. Mr. Pritchett died. I did, took this image in 2010. He, he passed away in 2012. And Mrs. Pritchett was a retired uh, probationary officer for the city of New York. This is Mr. and Mrs. Brooks, one of my favorite pictures. So um, <laughs> I took this image around 2003. So I saw Mr. and Mrs. Brooks. They were about to cross the street. Um, this was around Fulton Street, um, I believe, around Quincy. And um, approached Mr. Brooks and just asked if I could take uh, th their photo. Mrs. Brooks told me no, before I could even finish speaking. <laughs> and Mr. Brooks, uh, I, I didn't give up and I said to Mr. Brooks, I said, sir, I'm doing a book on the neighborhood and I would really love if I could take your photograph because I'm honoring the pioneers of this community. And he said, you're doing a book? And I said, yes, sir. He said, you're gonna do a book? And I said, yes. And he said, you can take our photo. Mrs. Brooks cut her eyes at Mr. Brooks and then he said, just straighten up, smile for the man. This was the photograph. Um, I sent them a copy of the picture. Um, didn't hear no response, but three years later, I got a call from their daughter asking me if I had any more copies of the photo. I said, sure, sent them a copy. She told me that her dad had passed away and this was their last photo together. Um, and then Mrs. Brooks got on the phone and said to me, you know what, young man, I really wanna thank you for just pushing, you know what, to take that picture. She said, I didn't feel I looked presentable. That's why I didn't want my picture taken, but that picture is a nice memory of what marriage is all about, trusting your partner. And she said, I'm so glad I trusted my husband. That was our last photo. She said, I wish you the best of luck with your book. And then when I sent them their picture, I got a card in the thank you card in the mail with $5 to buy a roll of film. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the last photo. Hope you enjoy Bedford Science, everybody. Yeah. Um, you guys, we have time for a brief q and I'll pass the, the mic around. It doesn't amplify your voice, it won't make it louder, but it's important for the video, so please use it. Uh, thank you for sharing your work with us. I mean, great work. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, right. and you know, I've been living here for 43 years, and I've seen the neighborhood change from when I grew up to now. I wanted to know, what is the emotional cost to you for doing a project like this? The emotional cost? Yeah. <sighs> Boy. Um, I could say there are, it, it, it pretty much fluctuates. I mean, there are plenty of times where I just feel extremely, you know, we're proud on many levels. Um, for one, just committing to do it, choosing to do it, as well as uh, taking the time to meet people to, uh, and I can't tell you in how many people who I photographed who just were so thankful that I even wanted to take a picture of them. Um, so the significance of pretty much uh, being, I think, the author of our own story meant a lot to me. Um, but it has also come with um, a lot of sadness, a lot of hurt going to the community. And as you can see, how many names, how many people are missing, and then businesses gone, uh, culture changing, um, people, you know what, just, uh, nervous about are they going to be able to stay. It has um, pretty much, uh, I would say, buoyed me in some ways, just knowing what's been happening, what is happening, to just keep on doing the work, keep on actually honoring the people, uh, get the story, get the work out to actually different audiences, because I think, you know, what is just important as uh, the community is changing, and just for people to learn this part of history, and for 
all the people who are just moving into the community and also to the international community who pretty much doesn't see, you know, a positive depiction of black America. Uh, it's super important for people, I think, and even those of us who are here to see, you know, what positive images of ourselves. So it is uh, one positive reinforcement. It's honor, um, it's sadness, but you know what? It's all done with, with love. And with that, I really can just uh, give thanks really to all of those who trusted me with their image. So, I mean, everybody who has just given me some of their time where uh, I was just, you know what, a, a young man with just passion and a dream and with good intentions. And for me, this work is really about the people, you know, so in everyone in here seeing, you know, we're getting to learn more about who is bed who has made a bed and all of these good people who have been slandered um, for me. Um, I don't want to take any credit. I just ride the wave and just pretty much make it my business to honor the community. I don't know if that's a good enough answer, bro, but <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you. What's your name? Patrick. Patrick. Glad you're here, Patrick. Thank you. Hey, Russell. Hey, what's going on, bro? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, two, two small questions. The first is, how has your Panamanian ancestry informed your work? And from the standpoint of process, what have you learned about your own craft, about your own process, your own artistry through this whole journey? Boy, um, being Panamanian um, in the community, being Panamanian, there's so much, you know, what I would say to it, because family from Panama, also too, with a lot of strong links to Jamaica, Barbados, um, and being Im an immigrant and knowing the story of a lot of people of immigrant backgrounds, I've always felt, you know what, it is just a purpose of mine in picking up the camera and actually a responsibility to be sensitive to those who I think uh, often, again, who don't maybe get a fair shake in how or don't even get a chance to even speak or feel uh, a little bit nervous to speak about where they may come from and their destiny and their purpose. Um, so as a Panamanian, um, my family coming to this country, 1965, uh, me being first generation born here, uh, I felt that I have to take on, you know, what uh, part of activism, and I would say this work is visual activism. You know what? At least for me, I hope it is for you. Um, that someone from the community, I think, needed to tell, as opposed to in thinking about how. The story has been told from a lot of people who've had good intentions, but just maybe have missed the mark culturally because, you know what, um, the culture just is not one that they have lived, that they know. And in terms of my process, uh, my process has pretty much just evolved, uh, Gordon. So from when I first picked up the camera, again, not knowing what I was doing, not knowing any history about photography, um, but then I could say, uh, coming into Kamonge, I got a schooling like I couldn't have gotten anywhere else. So between Kamonge and working at the Associated Press, um, these were actually two training grounds that just gave me perspective from many different levels. From one with Kamange, I would say, is learning the importance of, you know what, honoring your people, of us being, you know what, um, taking, uh, doing work with compassion, uh, taking, you know what, time to actually develop a story, to um, do it from a place of dignity, from the Associated Press, learning about storytelling, 
learning about editing, um, learning also to just how to get work out there. Um, and then, you know what, meeting just several people along the way, having some still time, and even when you are having one of those moments when you are in the valley, and you're in the valley, and you aren't sure whether you should be doing this, you're not making no money, your girlfriend's telling you to get a job, <laughs> you know what, um, you, you aren't supported, um, and, but this is where your heart is. This is really your love. And when you find that sense of purpose, you know what, and that sense of fulfillment, there is no substitute. There is no alternative. And with that process right there um, of fulfillment, I go on, I get some inspiration, I get some encouragement, whether it may be from peers, whether it may be going to an exhibit, and just also to being a sponge for information. Always learning, never getting full of myself, no matter how good I am, that you know, what there's, wherever there's good, there's better. You know, no, no matter where you may be. So um, with that, you know what, Gordon is always thinking about how can I tell a better story? How can I, you know what, um, add on to the work? Um, and yeah, there you go, bro. <laughs> Good enough? We'll talk later. <laughs> uh, let me just say that you have a gift with the camera. Uh, and you also have a gift of just making people feel good and want to do good work. So we thank you for the inspiration. Um, great work Thanks as always. I've, I've always been interested in how we as individuals visualize home, um, how we define home yes, uh, in, in light of how it, how it changes, right. but also with respect to how we change through time. Yes, sir. And I know that you've, you've spent some time in Ethiopia so spend some time away from home. Right. And I'm wondering, how has your perspective changed? Do you want to tell different stories? What do you value about home now that you've spent some time away from home? Great question. Great question. Um, so yeah, for those of you who don't know, so Brother Jabali over here, I spent almost uh, six months last year between Ethiopia and South Sudan. So uh, in Ethiopia, I was teaching photography, was doing some workshops actually with uh, UNESCO um, and pretty much just uh, empowering and educating a lot of Africans, you know, what to be the authors of their own story and showing them the value of doing work based in their community. Um, and going there and seeing, for one, just, uh, oh man, just humility, passion for life, um, this determination and will that you see people who have, uh, I would say, they don't have the same infrastructure and access to resources that we do and not the same liberties that we have or freedom that they have of speech um, and even to photograph, making photographs over there is particularly, you know, what tough, um, particularly because of images that just came out of Ethiopians during the famine. Um, a lot of Ethiopians are even resistant to even their own people photographing them. Um, so in going over there, it humbled me even more to, you know, what take time you know what, to get to know people. It also made me just think about just really how blessed and thankful I am for just uh, all the people who trusted me with their image. It made me even more committed, you know what, to the image in being there. Uh, in going there also too, uh, it just lit a spark again about the importance of giving back and you know with developing others and how in being from this community I have a responsibility to make my community better and not just even through photography so in being you know what in Ethiopia and seeing how um, 
people are very much, you know what, uh, particularly in Addis, um, just seeing how there, there's just a love that is just really un, un, unspeakable. I mean, you, you just, oh man, it, it's, it's, it's something you need to experience, uh, is one thing I say for everybody. Um, in going there, first time going to Africa and seeing Lucy, learning about, you know what, my ancestry and learning about pride, again, it was another ingredient for how I have to honor our community. Good enough, Jabali? Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. I know that you've had many mentors, and amongst those mentors was Gordon Parks. I would have loved to have been a fly on a wall when you had the opportunity to uh, meet him. I was wondering if he had any words of encouragement that may have influenced your life and your style of shooting. You was putting all my business out there, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, well, Mr. Parks, I won an award of Mr. Parks in 2003, 2004, and had the privilege of meeting him. One of our Kamonge, um, our Kamonge president, Adja Cowens, actually um, set up an interview, set up, actually made the introduction, and he welcomed me, invited me to his home, and um, Boy, oh boy, I, I felt like I met Jesus, quite frankly. Um, and I, in meeting him, I can only say just how thankful I was to have an opportunity to, to talk with him. And his, at that time when I met him, I was working at the Associated Press. And he asked me if I shot for the Associated Press, and I told him no. And he said, what's their problem? And um, he just told me, you know what, I showed him this same work. And um, he told me I was a fine photographer. And he said to me just to never give up. He said, never give up, no matter what may happen, you know what, the industry does not define you. Let your work define you. And um, that was some incredible advice. And he even gave me a letter of recommendation when I applied for a position, a, a photography position at AP that I did not get, just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he gave me a letter of recommendation. Um, there you have it, Mark. <laughs> I want to just add uh, something to that question. Yes. Um, we have um, John Edwin Mason joining us for I3 lecture series November 15 and he's going to spend uh, the entire lecture talking about the legacy of Gordon Parks. Uh, so please join us again in a few weeks November 15. Uh, John Edwin is coming especially to New York City to talk about Gordon Parks. He's writing what is probably going to be the book the definitive book on Gordon Park's legacy. So, you know, we're really excited about that. I want to thank Russell Frederick. Uh, that's all the time we have tonight, but what a great lecture. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Russell Frederick as tonight's guest speaker. Born in Brooklyn and of Panamanian descent, Russell is best known for his long-term documentation of the life in his neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant. His many editorial clients include the New York Times, the Daily Beast, the Wall Street Journal, NBC News, the Associated Press, the World Photography Organization magazine, Photo District News, Spiegel magazine, Slate, New York magazine, Ebony, and the Amsterdam News. Among many other venues, his photographs have been exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, 
the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Rush Arts Gallery, the International Center of Photography, Addis Photo Festival in Ethiopia, the Goethe Institute, Ghana, Visa Purlimash, and the Shanghai International Photo Festival. Russell is also a proud member of Komoinge Inc. I see a few familiar faces here tonight. Welcome Komoinge. Um, it's an African-American photography collective known for its 50 plus years documentation of African diaspora. Beyond photography, Russell dedicates his time to mentoring at-risk young men with the Kings Against Violence Initiative, where he is the men's program director. So please help me welcome Russell Frederick to our lecture series. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to see you all. Just my honor to the people who made this community. I started documenting the community in 1999. Uh, 1997 was actually when I made my commitment to photography. So before this, I was an architecture student. Um, always was, had artistic nature in me from childhood. But my family being from Panama and doing artwork, they were like, art is a hobby. That is not a job, not a career. So when going through the channels of life, architecture school, found that way too tedious for my brain, um, left that alone, then actually got introduced to nursing. My mom was a nurse and really enjoyed that. But I found that environment way too stringent for, my, for, for me. <laughs> and picked up a camera, actually 1995, had no idea what I was doing, didn't know the difference between an F-stop and a bus stop. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> figured it out in 1997, uh, took an intro course at the International Center of Photography, saved up my money. I read an article in Time Out magazine about intro to black and white film, and I said, okay, I'm gonna just see what this is about. On the first day of class, an instructor by the name of Bernard Pillay, he told me I would be a great photographer. I never looked back, couldn't afford to go to school. So I just went to Barnes and Nobles, like almost every day, looked through magazines, books, studying photos, taking pictures voraciously. And in 1999, I saw the writing on the wall about what's happening in bed right now. Everybody thought I was crazy at the time when I said that this community was gonna change. Everyone, people, people in the community were like, Russell, this is, especially on this chilly night, I'm sure everybody would like to be home with the remote control in their hand, um, having some coffee or soup. Glad you were here. Um, so I'm gonna take you all just on a little walk with me um, through the place that was my home for 18 years. Um, I uh, was born in Bushwick, in my childhood and my adult years were actually spent in Bed-Stuy. I got my first apartment in Bedford-Stuyvesant at the age of 19, and I lived there until the age of 37. Um, at the age of 19, uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, for those of you who don't know, may be unfamiliar, it is the other black mecca um, on the opposite side of the bridge and over to Harlem. So everyone uh, pretty much around the nation knows as Harlem to be the black mecca, but Bedford-Stuyvesant also too has been rich and you know with black culture. Um, the list goes on and on. People, Lena Horns from Bedford-Stuyvesant, Earl Graves from Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, Jackie Gleason even lived in Bedford-Stuyvesant. That's right, believe that, Jackie Gleason. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of you know Jay-Z. Uh, rapper Big Daddy Kane, Lenny Kravitz, I can go on and on and on and on. Chris Rock, everybody knows. Um, but for me, and just to give you a little bit more background, Bedford-Stuyvesant uh, is always a place that never got, I think, a fair shake uh, to the pioneers and the good people who made the community. Often just portrayed for its challenges and never really seen, I would say, for its virtues. So um, with some of the pictures you're about to see, um, you're gonna see um, a fitness instructor and she's also a life coach. She uh, got her master's degree actually in 2013. Um, 
lived in Bed-Stuy uh, for over 15 years and no longer lives in the community. Now she's in um, Atlanta, couldn't afford, you know what, to stay in the community anymore. Easter Sunday, Bed-Stuy. Uh, this is taken at the AME uh, Methodist Church. This is over by Tompkins and Decatur, I believe. Um, so right after Easter Sunday church, ladies actually from South Carolina, I just approached them, asked them if I could take their picture. They were waiting for access to ride, and there goes the photo. This is three generations. Um, this is a Santeria church, actually on Fulton Street, close to Bedford Avenue. So this is actually um, grandmom, daughter, and granddaughter right before a service. Did this image in 2007. And I believe the church is still, still there. This is um, Reginald Lewis. And on the left with the, you know what, furry white beard and his good friend of I think 30 years, uh, can't remember his name right now, but this was actually taken in 2014 at the 25th anniversary of the Spike Lee block party. Reginald Davis and, and the other brother have lived in the community for over 40 years. This is Sean Flowers, literally, that's her name. She is from Belize. Um, Sean is actually your educator. Um, uh, she was actually waiting for a taxi and the biggest black community in America. Where are all these people gonna go? I said, watch. So I'm gonna introduce you to some of the people. Enough talking, let's get to photos. I have quite a few to show you, but I, I can tell you pretty much the story on each photo, but I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background on some of the pictures. Uh, photo over here was taken in 2006 or 2007. This is Supernova Slum. He is a rapper, community activist, author, also two uh, retired National Guardsmen, and he's also a dream director at the Future Project. Um, he is also two part Cherokee Indian. He uh, has that the feathers in his hair are acknowledging or representing his. Cherokee heritage. The beads were actually red and blue to signify unity between the Bloods and Crips gang. The Egyptian um, tattoos you see are pretty much his homage, you know, to the ancestors. Moving on. So on this day, it was like 90 something degrees. Supernova was feeling himself. He just came out the gym. And um, for the most part, um, I pretty much had saw the advertisement on the back by the subway. This actually, for those who um, probably weren't in the community at the time, or in New York at the time, this was an ad for TV One. So TV One, um, all black um, television network, uh, I believe with Time Warner or Cablevision, uh, they started that this year, and this was their ad, I See Black People. So uh, sometimes I just like to play off of words uh, because they can have add a little bit more body to a photograph and just waited for the right moment, and there you go. This is uh, Maat Petrova. She's actually from Trinidad and Tobago. She is a mother of three. She is also 